this, uh, there's this Hungarian music video that I want you to, to look at. And it relates to that thematic unit of the feminine ideal. I want you to see, in the modern context, just what sort of the, uh, the feminine image is competing against. So that's what I want you to see right now. I want you to consider it and then give me like a quick summary at the end of what it sort of tells us and sort of a message behind the video. You don't know the lyrics, but it, the visuals, shh, the visuals are certainly speaking for themselves. So go ahead and watch right now, and it's no talking time now. So if you are getting your stapler and things like that and you're getting your stuff collected because you didn't put it in the packet, there's no talking with that. Shh. Okay. Does that feel uh, does that feel normal to you, or does that seem kind of strange or shocking or anything along those lines? She looked better before. That's an interesting idea. Why why would you say that? Because she looked computerized. She looks sort of fake, doesn't she, at the end? Yeah. But but that's what I my initial question there is: Does that look normal at the end? Because in what ways is the end result? sort of the norm in terms of what you see what you see in the uh with art yeah
It, it looks to see the beginning and after of, of a work. Do you normally get to see the before and after of a, a product like that, like an image that has been created and developed and manufactured and commercialized, ready for mass consumption? Most of the time, you're not seeing the makeup, which is all of the, I guess, physical enhancements. And then from there, all of the digital enhancements, which are pretty recent, right? The last 10, 15 years or so, we've seen these digital enhancements, even of video and, and of, of moving images. Everyone can have their uh, digital enhancements that make them beyond the realistic feminine ideal. But it, it's so much greater than a painting. Paintings we know are what? Or sculptures, that is, as opposed to moving video. There's a difference between the two. Yeah, sculptures are still, and we know that they're not real. And so there's sort of a trickery, there's an illusion that goes even deeper. So I just thought that was an interesting sort of continuation to the feminine ideal, the idea that not only might you be competing with this sort of artistic ideal of, of femininity or, or of womanhood, but also of a digital sort of enhanced version of, of all of those things as well. All the color needing to be perfect, all the splotches in the face. Did you notice, what were some of the other kind of surprising things that they did to her face in, in that process eyes. that she didn't think it's were necessary. Skin tone. That skin tone. Now, what? where did they go with it? Did they, they go darker? Lighter. They made her lighter. So that this happens quite often. If, if you notice, in uh, if you've ever looked at the uh, before and after of pictures, makeup tends to try and draw the skin tones lighter. And that's not just like, oh, because it works better with the, the lighting of the, uh, of the setting or the context. It has to do with a, a westernized or a, a, an expectation that light skin tone is an ideal. And this has gone along for a long time. And it should be a bit frustrating to some of you. And it should be something of a to cause awareness to others. What else was done besides the skin tone that might have been a bit surprising? Yes. Her hair, her eyes. I think actually changed her eye color. They changed her eye color quite a bit. Yeah, there was all that sort of color palette. And what else? Uh, yeah. Her neck. Like, what about her neck? Uh, they like made it like. They blurred it and they changed the shape, right? Yeah. So the normal muscles that you use to keep your head up, they they got rid of. So they de-emphasized elements of a normal anatomy in order to promote a, at least in that moment, a sense of beauty because that person, unrealistically, is now an object uh, that emphasizes elements of beauty as opposed to a real person. In fact, uh, I did a report when I was in college on, on this kind of digital enhancements, and they often <coughs> recommend that you get rid of like musculature in your, uh, in your arms if you're a female, so meaning you get rid of it, you get slender, even though you have to work out and work hard in order to keep a, like a model's body or like a strong body. But then you got to get rid of all of those things because you don't want to look too masculine. So there's these constant, unrealistic, conflicting expectations I think are interesting to observe. And when you know it, you can be empowered by it, I think. One of the last things said that something about the eyes. What else? There's something surprising to me when I saw what they did with the eye. They took one eye and flipped it and made it similar. Now, why is that? What principle of design are they trying to achieve perfectly? Uh, like a perfect symmetry and proportion. So if your eyes are naturally a slightly askew or asymmetrical, most people have a slight asymmetry. But that doesn't look good. Uh, it might be enhanced, that kind of asymmetry on a camera. And so they get rid of those, those things that might cause distraction to the person's beauty. So they get rid of literally one eye becomes less important than the other. They flip it around and they blend it and it looks like you are this perfect statuesque reconstruction of a person as opposed to a natural person. Um, so things to keep in mind when you're looking at magazines or you're thinking about diets or, or those kinds of things, uh, or your makeup choices or whatever it is, uh, and, and for the men as well, to consider that there is a realistic expectation as well as there is a manufactured expectation that's kind of promoting a product more than it is teaching people how to be human. So I just wanted to, to, to throw that there, sort of a final thought, and uh, hear what you guys had to say about that. Um, that's a very fascinating topic. Now, the next time we do uh, a thematic unit, <clears throat> well, 
there'll be a, it'll be in, when we get to Rome, but we'll hit the masculine ideal too. So it'll be the men's turn as well to see what are some of the issues that we uh, deal with as, as men in society and what is the expectations regarding our image and our behavior, etc. So we'll be looking at those things as well. But right now, you have a new packet. Let's uh, go to the ancient Near East. By the way, if you've heard that music, I mentioned it. It's a 4,500-year-old uh, Eastern ancient Near East lyre and pipe. So it kind of sounds a little bit Scottish or Gaelic. It has sort of that, those long, sustained notes. And that's what they think the music sounded like. We don't know for sure because no one's uh, no sheet music or no music theory exists at the time. So it's kind of interesting to see what people do with the instruments. But we're going to look at instruments as well. Uh, both of these works here are from different cultures within the ancient Near East, which we will look at in turn. This is an, an earlier for, version. Uh, and this is Assyrian, and this is, uh, this is Babylonian. So we'll look at each one of these. And this will be due next Tuesday. I'll give you a warm-up here real quick. Uh, oh, excuse me, next Wednesday, because you get a full week on these. Uh, give you a quick warm-up, so on a piece of paper that does get attached to the back of your packet, I want you to take five minutes. In a team, you want to just sort of start kicking out ideas right, right away so that we can get started. That would be great, and at that point, we'll do a quick discussion of each team and what you had to say about this topic. But the topic will connect to the ancient Near East. It is an important theme that uh, will continue this week's thematic unit. will be on religious narratives, so we'll learn a little bit about world religions. And, the ancient Near East is sort of the hotbed of most of the, the most major world religions uh, currently ex existing today. Uh, and your question has to do with the connection of religion and politics. What role does religion play in politics? So you maybe take a, a stab at that question. What do you think is going on? But why do you think faith is seen as an important trait of leaders? We tend to pick people who display a sense of faith, something, uh, something uh, religious perhaps, uh, with our leaders, both in this country and abroad. You can just limit it to this country if you like. And how might faith be a help and or hindrance to good governance? I want you to think on both sides uh, of this question. So go ahead and write a couple of quick notes and then start uh, sharing out with the neighbor, see who's going to uh, share out to the whole team. So you got five minutes. Go. No, don't write down the question. Just write the answers, please. And while you do so, enjoy more of this wonderful music. Now, 
this could be a Socratic seminar question, but yes, um, it should be. <laughs> yeah, we should do this tomorrow. But we do need to, because of the uh, four-day week, we really need to get finished with ancient Near East as timely as possible. So Socratic seminar will have to wait. We will we will come back to this topic when it's appropriate again. Can be sort of the beginning part of that. You have one minute. About 30 seconds, and then we're going to share out with our team here. By the way, if you have any conflicts within your team, you like agree or disagree about something, uh, you can just relate that. You don't have to say, well, that person you know, thought this. Or say, like, these are the differences that we had. For instance, if someone in your team thinks that faith is a hindrance to good government, I would like to know that. I would like to hear it. I think that would make for interesting discussion. Makes it bad to govern with religion. Does it make it good to govern with religion? Start with this table here, since we started on the other side last time. Give me some answers here. Okay. Okay. And in what way would it cause um, separation or, or prejudice? If someone doesn't agree or, you know, separate a group of people from the rest of society. Very good. If you didn't have something uh, regarding the idea of uh, you know, separation or prejudice or something like that, write that down as a potential con of, of religion in, in, in governance, right? So it, it makes sense that if uh, you have everyone who has the same religion, that the politicians or the political sort of leadership would also convey a sense of that religion as well. But when you have people of different faiths that you are also governing, it becomes a little bit more difficult, doesn't it? So you can't necessarily do those things without, by de facto, sort of discriminating, potentially. Of course, there are ways around that or ways to limit that kind of discrimination today. Uh, the other thing you said is that it depends on the type of religion. So maybe there are religions that are by by uh, its own sort of admission or doctrine are more inclusive than other religions. For instance, what would be an example, does anyone know of religion, for extra credit, that might allow for a, a very pluralistic view of gods or of, of, of the faiths and faith traditions? Yes? Uh, Islam? Islam. So, um, so that's an interesting sort of open question about whether Islam is willing to allow for many different faiths within itself. I would assume that 
Islam, at least someone who has an orthodox view, would have uh, would, would confess how many gods, for instance, in Islam? One. Yes. <laughs> one god. So you wouldn't say necessarily that one god, uh, Allah, is the same as uh, like the Hindu gods of Shiva, for instance. You wouldn't have. So that would be that would be sort of the opposite. You wouldn't have. For Islam, it would be like a very narrow. Uh, view of and a very specific view of, of God and religion in that sense, meaning you're not as inclusive of, of other faith traditions that may conflict. Yes. Uh, Judaism again. How many gods in, in an Orthodox Jewish faith? One. One. Um, so maybe in a maybe in a sort of a secular Jewish context, they might be open, but. It wouldn't be that a Jew would be a good Jew or a good Jewish person uh, in, in the sense that he is an Orthodox Jew wouldn't necessarily allow for the worship um, of Shiva in that, in that sense. Now, obviously, they're not going to cause other people, they're not going to force uh, other people to believe the same thing as them, but I'm thinking about themselves. Can they include and say it's okay to believe these other things? There is a, there's a few religions that are inclusive. We're not hitting them yet. Those are the monotheistic religions that are very... Uh, non-inclusive or specific, yes. Um, Shintoism. Shintoism. Um, again, sort of a folk religion in Japan, uh, Japanese cultures, uh, very broad in its sort of folk development. So this is an example of an inclusive, more of an inclusive religion in that sense because it's a, an animistic development. Yes. Hinduism. Hinduism is also a, a sort of a major world religion that is inclusive in the sense that there's a lot of different uh, faith traditions that are encompassed under Hinduism. That is to say that they allow for um, you can you can have a, 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 a an Islamic Hindu. There's a, there are people who do those kinds of things with their faith. So interesting, and we'll learn specifically about those faith traditions, those re world religions, uh, this week with the thematic unit. Okay, so it depends on the type of religion, and it depends, of course, on the amount of the plurality of religions within a community. That might decide on one of those things. What else do we have? Yes. You guys here? I'm gonna go through each one of the teams. Oh, okay. So, anyway. like, no one raised my hand. Okay. Okay. So I said religion forms the boundaries at which a government is formed. Okay. Police within a region leads the way a leader rules his people, and what form of government a nation chooses, such as democracy, tyranny, and communism. Faith in a leader helps him or her have a stronger bond towards the rights and beliefs of the government. It also means that the leader has a type of balance in the amount of power he or she has. As a democracy, the differentiation of religions create prejudice, a slightly conflicting social unrest. Yet having positive and diverse faith teaches the leader to respect other religions as well. So I'm going to break that down. That was very articulate. Very good. Um, and if you haven't written something like these three things down, that's what uh, I want you to do to kind of add to yours. Uh, number one, it seems like a faith in a uh, the leader that has has faith seems to govern best. It seems like this is a, a universal human trait because people who have faith believe in something higher than themselves, and so as a, as a, a proxy to that, they have a sense of authority. So authority by faith, something simple you can write down. Authority by faith, because it's not my commands; it is whose commands. It's my God's commands, and I'm just relating those things to you. Or you also believe in God, and I believe in God. Therefore, we have a similarity. Now you, you see me as as a prominent figure as a result of that. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you mentioned sort of a balance between what it means to have a secular administration or some type of, you know, we got to pay the water bill, we got to, you know, go to war, those kinds of things, and those religious aspects, how we pray together, how we maintain a sense of unity or community. So, uh, so unity through faith as well as through uh, administration. So you can use both of those terms there, faith and administration. Those are important things that seem to relate politics to religion. What was another aspect? I'm just going to give me another aspect from there so I can give them a third point to make. Uh, uh, a positive and diverse faith. A positive and diverse faith is a good thing, is what you're saying. Yes, so you're not, only, not only are you positive in what you believe in, but oh, it's I also see. diverse. So oh, I see. Okay, so positive in the sense that you believe something, right? And it's and it's it's a good thing that you believe. Okay, 
So we often like to see that people have some type of faith uh, because if someone has a, a faith, it's sort of like a we know what you believe kind of thing. There's a transparency to that or there's an actual thing. When people always define themselves by what they don't believe, it can, tends to murky the waters. They don't know what people actually value. And we want to have people that have a diverse or an openness to other faiths today. But was that always the, the case? Is that always the case around the world? And is that always the case here uh, at home? And is that the case throughout history? That we, we want a leader who lets everyone do whatever they want with their religion? I think that's an interesting question. It's an open question. <coughs> How many non-Christian presidents have we had? <coughs> Even though they might be open, but how many non-Christian presidents? I, I don't know, because more than likely they've all professed Christianity to certain and lesser extents, but they wouldn't uh, ever say necessarily that they're atheists yet. But those are questions that we see as, as we see uh, societies change. What do you guys have here? I'm going to give you one point each for the rest of the, the groups here. Go quick. All right, so far as we said that uh, it's important in politics because it takes the choices of a political figure and see faith as an important trait uh, because, well, like I already said, it sort of dictates the choices and the uh, like people who share the same religion as this leader will possibly get some sort of like will possibly be biased towards them. Right. And then for the second question, you said that we see faith as a hindrance for politics because, uh, like I said earlier, it's like some religions will uh, result like benefits that others won't really realize they're getting. Right. I like what you said about limiting choice. I think that's a very specific and good example. If you didn't write something about limiting choice. We don't need a ton of choices as leaders. In fact, how many part political parties do we have today? Three. A lot. Three? A lot. When have we had three political well I mean like back, three back three viable the- political parties. Okay. Have you had two. we really have a two party system. Now you're right, we have other parties as well. We have about five parties that you can really choose from. But we're really a two-party system because two is just elegant, isn't it? You get a limited choice. And a lot of times governance is about limiting your choices. To have choice is important, isn't it? But to limit choice is also important. So that might be also part of religion. You can do X, 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 Y, and Z, but you can't do A, B, and C. And in that sense, you feel comforted in a boundary. It's very good. So limiting choice, make sure you write that down. This one over here at back table. Uh, Just write, read what you have to say, maybe one or two points. Uh, like religion uh, takes like a, a decision-making role. Okay. And, uh, for a leader, and I kind of, I kind of said what I don't know who else said it, but I said that him, him or her looks at uh, doesn't believe that they are the highest. They they look up to someone higher than themselves, and it can also be a hindrance because some people always throw religion at your face won't always come to a consensus, consensus or something else. Okay, so again, that second, you're seconding the idea of it being a potential hindrance because instead of working together with someone, there might be uh, a general lack of um, unity as a result of religious differences. You're also saying that the leader can also be considered a servant. So I, if you didn't write something like that down, I think you should. Leaders considered servants. We don't like leaders to be too proud, do we? In fact, that, that posture, if you see Obama here, President Obama, uh, in a, a sense of um, humility in a little bit. Um, it's, it's a servant role to be a president. And when, uh, when a president or when a leader is serving God or his, uh, or his particular faith, he's also serving the people by proxy. Okay, did it work? Or did it it's, it's okay. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So you can see that he's sort of in a posture of, in fact, that whole like submissive posture of religion uh, tends to make people feel comforted. And we need leaders who aren't just like, da, da, but sometimes we like that too, because religion can also show that I am powerful over my enemies. When I defeat somebody else in battle, whose who's, uh, praise is it? Is it my praise? Could be, it could be my praise through God, or through my gods who have enabled me. Uh, and it, you get, in even in some sense, you get the complete opposite of this, where you get people who say, I am literally what? God. Think of pharaohs, right? I am God on earth. 
Okay. So those are an interesting gamut or boundary or, or, or gradient of the types of expressions that leaders have with religion. Okay, one point over here. So I think what you're expressing is more of a modern view of a tolerance. When, when two people have different religions, we need to sort of arbitrate that as a government, as opposed to enforcing one religious view on top of somebody else. Good. So we have a, we have a modern distinction with how politics and religion play a part. Even though, would you say that a lot of our politicians are religious? Yeah. Yeah, I think very much so. In fact, in Texas, if you, I don't know if you know this, but in Texas, it's actually illegal for an atheist to hold office. It's sort of a weird uh, art, um, artifact of a, of a pre-constitutional or pre-system uh, sort of, system of, of, of separation of powers, in that sense, separation of the church and state that they have there. So if you're a professing atheist, you actually can't hold office in Texas. So there are areas, there are places in which it's very clearly you can't, you can't be of a particular religion and be in politics but we try and limit that as much as possible. In our modern society, we understand that separation. Uh, yes, this table here. I think it gives uh, people a sense of unity. Good. Because if the leader is in religion, it seems to be kind of like, oh, it's here too, because we have to right. So the sense of unity, just like uh, just like what we've said. Good. And this table here? Um, we said it would serve kind of as a rock for people and like, something to rely on. Good, so it's not just me, it's some sort of external thing, a rock, some sort of foundation. So if you didn't write something about a foundation or or like, it's not just something I look to, but it literally never changes. That's actually an important point, like a rock, right? So that's good. When, when I appeal to God, God doesn't change even if the leader does. The dictates or the doctrines don't change even though I do. My religion is 2,000 years old, 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 old. And then from that, I can get sort of a sense of authority because of how old it is. It's a different thing when it's an ancient religion or an, an established religion. And so these are important traits to the authority that religion can often possess in politics. I want you to keep that in mind now because now we're going to take that these themes here and kind of apply them to artistic themes. So I just want you to take those themes and again and apply them. Let's do some historical context for a second in your... Uh, packet. So go to start your note process here. Uh, we have the historical context of the prehistoric era. And for the first time, the biggest differences that occur between the prehistoric era and what we call the ancient world of the historic era are two things. The first thing is our innate ability to, to innovate to the point where we're able to uh, create cities and manipulate the natural world around it. Sort of an early version of science. If I find that I cut this stone in small enough vectors, I can create a wheel. And that wheel is a simple machine that can, through a uh, through sort of a center spoke or a joint, I can create a wheelbarrow. I can move things that are heavier than me very quickly and effectively. And I can create tools for myself. I can dig irrigation through uh, various types of crude or elementary tools, and eventually I can construct cities and walls, and I can sit in one place and farm. So the Neolithic Revolution is what we call that kind of uh, manipulation of nature that humans are so good at. And this occurs around 3500 BCE. The idea of, for instance, having a plow and a wheel. These are big anchor dates that you need to know in the beginning of human civilization. This occurs in sort of this crescent of ferti this, this fertile crescent of, of human existence, where humans begin to dominate uh, in, in a region beyond uh, in, in beyond the other sort of competing uh, uh, upright uh, species that we've like the Neanderthal and all these other uh, types of uh, Australopithecus and all these other people. 
throughout the the regions there these groups are sort of dying out or have already died out and the human as a uh, as a dominant species has has uh, triumphed so with the 3500 BCE is these developments of the wheel of settlements and that sort of thing then there's a second thing that happens uh, by the uh, the start of the ancient Near East as a movement of people and that is well what what makes us call this a, his, a history when we get past the prehistory to history what would be the change that occurs or what people are able to discover figure out yes well, I was gonna say, like yeah, records, of records. How do you and how do you keep records of something? Yes. And you're even assuming something uh, even more elementary than that. Where they carved it? What What is even more elementary than where they carved it? How? Not how, because it's wow. even more elementary than that. When they Not just the stuff. <laughs> when what? Yeah. Um, something very basic. You're assuming. You're assuming something even more basic that they're going to carve their 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 records into stuff. I'm thinking about what they're uh, what actually they're carving, which is their language and the idea that we have a written language is is a new thing. Okay, so just know that that wasn't always around. Prehistoric peoples did not have written languages in any <coughs> discernible or codified way. So written language, the ones at least that we understand, occur near this time period with the cities and the settlements. And the earliest type of codified language is the Sumerian uh, language, the Sumerian written language. It's called, it's called Sumerian. There is, a, there is a Phoenician kind of pictograph system that is also sort of being developed at this time period. So Phoenicians are also doing this um, off to the side, off to the uh, off to the left in the region, and Egypt is also developing a hieroglyphic system, but Sumeria is actually doing it nearly first. But it's a sort of a common phenomenon. They're competing with Phoenicians to do this. Uh, so the Sumerian government layout, just to kind of know a little bit about how they how they created their systems, they're city states, which means that they are. Uh, in and of themselves, large walled communities, and the city is in fact its own government. So they're sm they're small compared to our states, right? But for them, the city state built around in inside of a wall is how they do it. And so each state is under the protection of a different Mesopotamian deity. So each state is actually uh, part of a religious cult, cultus, which is a, like a religious ritual. They recognized all of the different uh, Mesopotamian deities. If I were living in uh, this particular city, I might recognize that the neighbor had a god himself, and I believe that his god is powerful too. But it's sort of like competing gods at that point. I have Ishtar, and uh, um, you have the moon goddess, or something along those lines. So when we can have these sort of competing Mesopotamian deities, uh, what we recognize is that our leaders are in fact the gods themselves and that everyone else that sort of does the administration work is beholden to that <coughs> god. It's an effective early form of government that humans do in order to maintain authority, maintain administrative uh, rights or ethos like an authority, um, an ethic, and allows them to sort of stay together, be unified, like you said. City planning and religion in the uh, Sumerian city plan reflected role of local god in the daily life of the occupants. They gave uh, they gave food to the god, they, they prayed to this god as part of their religion, and, or part of their religious ceremonies. And in fact, sort of the largest and, and most prominent function of the city-states was to protect and promote the large temple in the center of the city-state. We call these temples ziggurats. ziggurats. So we'll look at ziggurats as an architectural form in a moment. So Sumerian government uh, landscape. Notice this is Katul Hayokif in Anatolia. This is the Black Sea, the Mediterranean. Here's Egypt, so you can kind of see where we're at. Here's where uh, like all the stuff going on with Israel and Palestinian problems are here. Uh, and then we have issues with like ISIS and all the bad stuff going on in Iraq. 
is sort of in this area here, if you notice. Uh, Iran would be up in the top area here. But these areas here, the reason why, in part, we can talk all sorts of politics there, which isn't really our class, but these, these places are very old. And as a result, they have a long and drawn out history of, of not only ethnic, but also religious development. And in part, that's part of the destabilizing forces that are at work. At their very core, they are there's a there's a sort of a tribalistic quality to all of these city states as a result of the Sumerian Empire and these other empires that ruled as these individual city states. So it's very interesting that the diversity that actually occurs very early on in the area. So this is Mesopotamia, the ancient Near East. There are three places, and I want you to do a quick sketch. It's a small one so that you can get some placements of maps. I don't, I'm not big on giving you a bunch of maps and having you color and stuff. I assume that you're going to know at least a little bit about these places uh, for the sake of yourself. You don't require geography issues, but you do need to know, for instance, that uh, Mesopotamia is the same as ancient Near East, and that you can kind of guess as to what different sort of areas are involved. So just go ahead and really quickly draw, maybe uh, starting from here, kind of go down a little bit, get some Egypt going, so you have Egypt down there. Draw a little river called the Jordan River. And then draw two rivers, sort of uh, maybe a few centimeters or inches, however big you want it to be, kind of make it small. And draw two uh, rivers kind of intersecting at the end here on the right side of your right side of your paper. That's going to be the Tigris and the Euphrates. I'm going to give you some cities now to put in. So go ahead and just do real quick, like here's Egypt, use, you know, do some squiggle lines. It's really quick. Just so that it's more like in, in relation to each other where things are. Turning from top to bottom, I'm going to start with regions. The region of Assyria is at the top. In the middle is a region called Akkad. These were also uh, names of city-states, but these city-states became so prominent that they literally uh, dominated a region. They dominated other people's lesser city-states, and so we named them regions. And the bottom is the region Sumer, and it's also relating uh, to a city as well. Sumer, and that's where we get Sumerian. It's one of the ancient religions, excuse me, ancient, uh, ancient people groups that we understand. Inside of Sumer, let's start down here for, for cities. You're going to need to know Uruk and Ur. Those are the two that you need. I know that sounds silly, but they are uh, different cities. Uruk, U-R-U-K, and Ur. There are several different important works that come from those two places. So just, just put those two dots. In Akkad, the big one is Babylon. You might have heard that term before. It's a popular... Um, imperial sort of it comes it crops up again Babylon when we think of an uh, empire in the ancient world we think of Babylon Egypt and Babylon are kind of the big ones and then also uh, Assyria at, at, for here you need to know Nineveh Nineveh is it all all three of those actually are all in in the Hebrew Bible and also in the Islamic scriptures and in the Christian scriptures. So these are all sort of relatable cities as well from those religious standpoints. Ur, Ur, in particular Ur. For instance, Abraham is from Ur. Babylon is all in, in the scriptures in the latter parts of the uh, Old Testament. So you have Daniel and sort of the prophets inside this imperial area. Because there's exile and that sort of thing. And Syria is also in the Bible. Nineveh is where Jonah goes and gets um, wants to you get swallowed by a whale if you know any of your, in your stories from the Hebrew Bible. So these are uh, these are thoughts to kind of know, or these cities to know and regions to know in the area. We'll study Egypt and Jericho and these sort of areas down here in a moment. But you know, Katalhayuk and Jericho are also important to the Neolithic areas. All right, we're going to start with Sumer and Uruk. And Uruk has uh, a very important, uh, what's called the White Temple. It's an early ziggurat. Sumerians so built towering step platforms of mud bricks. We call these ziggurats. And at the very top of the ziggurat, which is actually the structure that elevates the 
the temple. There is a temple, a simple sort of post and lintel square construction or cuboid construction at the top. Um, it's about 50 foot mound, ultimately, that keeps it high above the city. All people can see it. Now, how many worshipers do you think this holds, this ziggurat holds? It could, but how many worshipers actually go into the temple? Zero. This isn't for worshipers. This is for the temples to house the gods. Oh, wow. So it's all for the gods. All for me, none for you. Okay. So we'll, we'll end there and we'll continue with the, the different architectural forms of ziggurats. And we'll look at that uh, tomorrow. You guys were good listeners today. Thank you. And good discussion. We'll start with this slide again next, uh, next time we meet on Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.